everybody. This is uh, wonderful to have us all together. Um, we get together twice a year for these special events uh, amongst fellow theosophists. Uh, this uh, undertaking today is something sponsored by the, the ULT. And we have representatives from the ULT from all over the globe in on the meeting today. Um, and we have representatives from other theosophical groups too. So everybody's welcome um, in this, uh, in the spirit of theosophy, universal brotherhood and sisterhood. We uh, were trying to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood and sisterhood and welcome all those who want to do the same. Um, today, we're, our, our theme for our Great Teachers Day, which we do as near as possible to November 17th, uh, the day of the Kumars, uh, Kumaras, um, is the self-governed sage. And we're going to be spending a good portion of our time today together um, listening to uh, your fellow students, our fellow students, uh, talk about the self-governed sage. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But our program today is on the screen right now. Um, and these are the things we're going to do. There's some readings we've got. We have some music. We've got uh, some talks on the self-governed sage from the Gita, of course. And we're going to hear the, the passage from Shankaracharya in seven different languages to kind of um, solemnize the, the moment. We have a, a reading of the Gayatri Mantram by Roshni. तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यं भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि धियो यो नह प्रचोदयात् ओम भूर्भुवस्वः तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यं भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि धियो यो नह प्रचोदयात् ओम भूर्भुवस्वः तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यं भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि धियो यो नह प्रचोदयात् ओम शांति 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 By what track can you allure one who is enlightened? Trackless indeed is he. His victory naught can undo. None of this world can touch that victory. He is seer of limitless range. By what track can you allure one who is enlightened? Trackless indeed is he. No net of desire can catch him. He is seer of limitless range. Even the devas, shining gods, aspire to emulate the enlightened wise who are great contemplators who are the peaceful ones, who are steadfast and tranquil. Difficult it is to obtain birth as a human. Difficult it is to live the life 
of a man. Difficult it is to get to hear the true law. Difficult it is to attain to enlightenment. Eschew all evil, cultivate and establish thyself in good. Cleanse thy mind, so teach the Buddhas. Enduring patience is the highest tapas. Nirvana is the supreme state. So teach the Buddhas. He who oppresses another is no recluse. He who harms another is no ascetic. Revile not, harm not, discipline thyself according to the law. Be moderate in eating, dwell with solitude. Be devoted to higher thought. Such is the teaching of the Buddhas. Lusts are never satisfied, not even by a shower of gold pieces. He who knows that enjoyment of passion is short-lived and also is the womb of pain is a wise man. Even in celestial pleasures, he finds no delight. The disciple of the supremely enlightened delights in the destruction of craving. Men driven by fear seek refuge on mountains, in forests, under sacred trees, or at shrines. Such refuge is not secure. Such refuge is not the best. Such refuge frees not a man from pain. He who takes refuge in the enlightened one, in the law, in the order, perceives clearly the four noble truths. Suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the noble eightfold path, treading which all suffering is transcended. That, verily, is the safe refuge, the best refuge. In that refuge, man is free from all pain. An exalted man is rare to find, not anywhere is he born. Wherever a wise and noble one is born, that household prospers. Blessed is the birth of the Buddha. Blessed is the teaching of the good law. Blessed is the concord in the order. Blessed is the austerity of those who live in Concord. So, Mr. Judge provided us with a rendition of the Gita that's very poetical. And we're going to be using it for the next uh, number of minutes to reference the section of the Bhagavad Gita that comes at the, at the at near the end of chapter two that by many students is called the self-governed sage. It is one of the finest portraits of the sage that humanity has um, and hence why we wanted to put some extra time into it. Um, what we'll be doing is we'll be reading out uh, passage by passage, and various students from around the world are going to spend a few minutes elaborating on those passages. And the whole dialogue in this part of the Gita begins with a question from Arjuna when he asks, What Okeshava is the description? 
of that wise and devoted man who is fixed in contemplation and confirmed in spiritual knowledge. What may such a sage declare? Where may he dwell? Does he move and act like other men? <clears throat> Krishna is speaking. A man is said to be confirmed in spiritual knowledge when he forsaketh every desire which entereth into his heart and of himself is happy and content in the self through the self. When a student asked Mr. Crosby once, if one could convey the truth to another, Mr. Crosby's reply was simply, we can only help another to see the truth within himself. Thus, our teachings encourage each to accept no external authority, rather to seek the only authority, which is the truth of an idea. This, of course, is coupled with one's ability, developed by self-induced means and self-devised methods, to recognize and understand the truth. And we do so as best we can, checked by karma. This we are each individually responsible for. So then what is spiritual knowledge? How does one know when one is confirmed in it? Well... Whatever it means, one who is confirmed in spiritual knowledge has to know this for himself. This might be the recognition and acceptance of inherent divinity within oneself and within all of life. Krishna tells us that a sign of confirmation is that every desire which enters the heart is abandoned, is forsaken. Were we in this space of spiritual knowledge then, it seems we might know that the joy and pleasure which comes from the outside world or which comes from the fulfilling of one's personal desires must also come with a fair share of pain and loss. It is this distraction we come to abandon this is what we will have forsaken. But why? Well, we have heard the serenity, the blissful security of spiritual knowledge is entirely beyond the fruits of personal desire. Such true security is not subject to the vicissitudes of this world. Perhaps we have here a small analogy. The analogy is we might experience a certain sample of such bliss in certain ways when we find we can rise against temptation. We at first may feel troubled or we may, may feel fear for the future without certain rewards that we've come to, to know in the past that we've come to accept. Yet we intuitively know the correctness of overcoming certain temptations. Krishna, in this passage, may even be talking about overcoming the ultimate temptation. Okay, then what is meant by he of himself can be happy and content in the self, through the self? This is perhaps where self-induced means and self-devised methods comes in. We inherently have the faculties to bring about these internal conditions which is to say, to be content in the self. The means are at our, at our disposal, in our heart and our head, just where and how to find and use the means is something that no one can decide for another. The means must be discovered or unveiled within the self by our own self-devised methods. All this we find coming about as we continue to follow the law of the self within our own nature. By living according to the law of the self, 
which is to say, by living through the self, through the law of the self, we may find the happiness, the contentment, we may even finally find ourselves confirmed in spiritual knowledge. Thank you. His mind is undisturbed in adversity. He is happy and contented in prosperity. He is a stranger to anxiety, fear, and anger. Such a man is called a Muni. At the beginning of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, we are still in Vishada Yoga or the despondency of Arjuna. Arjuna is coming to Krishna with a lot of sorrow in his heart and tears in his eyes. Krishna spends most of this chapter talking to him about what is mortal and what is immortal in him and lays out the Shankya doctrine. Like a child who is crying and is appeased when he gets a toy, Arjuna, somewhat calmer after Krishna's exposition, asks several questions about the qualities of a self-governed sage, or in Sanskrit, sthita pragna. Krishna spends most of the remaining second chapter talking about the qualities of a sthita pragna. This is verse 56. And Arjuna hears from the great teacher this, that a self-governed sage has reached a point where troubles do not trouble him and there is contentment and peace within him in good times. In other words, the pairs of opposites in life do not disturb his mental state. Bhavani Shankar, who was a devoted student of H.P. Blavatsky, gave a series of lectures on the Bhagavad Gita, talks about these verses saying that the sage is beyond his causal body or karana sharira, Krishna adds, Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha, which translates as being devoid of anxiety, fear, and anger. Mr. William Quan Judge states it as, he is a stranger to anxiety, fear, and anger. These attributes of the lower mind plague our ordinary lives constantly. Anxiety and fear paralyze us and prevent us from thinking calmly. The same is true of anger. In addition, anger has a more deleterious effect on us. Judge in his article called Culture of Concentration states, when the student allows anger to arise, the influence of it is at once felt by the ethereal body and manifests itself in an uncontrollable trembling, which begins at the center and violently pulls apart the hitherto coherent particles. There is actually a destruction of the ethereal body, which needs to be recreated slowly. The process is long and tedious, but once the mind has control over these three obstructions, then he is a self-governed sage or a muni. He has access to the mountaintop and attains a universal perspective. Thank you.
when in every condition he receives each event, whether favorable or unfavorable, with an equal mind which is neither likes nor dislikes, his wisdom is established, and having met good or evil, neither rejoices at the one nor is cast down by the other. I'd like you all to join me by taking a moment to simply rest by closing your eyes and imagining a beautiful, clear blue sky, the bluest of blue. Imagine this filling all of space as far as the eye can see. In fact, it's so vast, this clear blue sky, that it feels as if it has no beginning nor end. Now imagine a magnificent sun set in the middle of this beautiful blue sky, its rays pouring out in all directions, illuminating all of space. Now the sun doesn't sit there illuminating one section of the sky and not the other. It doesn't have likes or dislikes or judging what part of the sky is good or bad. It has no preference. It's just it just shines unceasingly outward, outward because it's selfless. It's not self-centered. It, it's selfless, and its rays of light is a pure selfless love intelligence, a pristine awareness that fills all of space. This sun is our true nature. Now, if the sun represents our true nature, Let's now imagine that the sky is our mind. And as the clouds roll in, these clouds, they can be our thoughts and experiences arising. And as these clouds of thoughts are appearing in our mind, we begin to fixate on them. They obscure the light of the sun and the pristine awareness, our very connection to the ultimate nature of our being. Even the air we breathe grows cold and thoughts turn into ice and the forms we imagine take on patterns that harden into the relative forms of our physical world. And that's where the conceptual mind steps in. The conceptual mind is the part of us that labels or names things, the house, the car, the trees. It breaks things down, chops things up into colors, shapes and sizes. It divides. And once the conceptual mind takes stage, we move away from our ultimate nature of pristine awareness. And by limiting ourselves to the conceptual mind, we chain ourselves to our suffering by grasping, fixating with our likes and dislikes, attaching to or aversion to the appearances of phenomena and our hopes and fears as they arise. Now at that point, we have a choice. We can get caught up in the conceptual mind with its judging, attachment, and aversions to suffering and fixating on our woes, or we can move beyond the conceptual mind, rising above the clouds where the sun shines to recognize and embrace our own ultimate nature that stays unchanged, no matter how many clouds, obscure. If we can just take a moment to move into the stillness of the center of our hearts, we will remember and recognize who we really are. And at the same time, we will have the clarity, the wisdom, awareness of the true nature of not only ourselves, but the true nature of the phenomena that make up our reality. The key is that there is no inherent existence to this phenomena that is unceasingly arising before us. It's not that they don't exist. It's that they don't have inherent existence, no real form to them. It's our consciousness that gives it form and our conceptual mind that grasps onto them, giving us the illusion that we experience. Knowing this, 
gives us that true freedom from samsara. Always remember, all phenomena that we perceive naturally arises, naturally arises in its purest form. And as long as we don't grasp or attach to it by our likes and disliking, it will remain in its original purity. Then dissolve and return to its original state of potentiality all on its own. Thank you. He is confirmed in spiritual knowledge when, like a tortoise, he can draw in all his senses and restrain them from their wanted purposes. The hungry man loses sight of every other object but the gratification of his appetite. And when he has become acquainted with supreme, he loses all, all taste for objects of whatever kind. This, I understand, refers to the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verses 58 and 59. The first key words, confirmed in spiritual knowledge and acquainted with the Supreme, is what I would like to stop at first. This is just enlightenment, the purpose of life. The Supreme is the Self. Transcendent, unbounded ocean of consciousness, self-sufficient, source, cause, and goal of the entire creation. This is big, and this is pure bliss. Absorbing the entire awareness of those experiencing it as they've expressed it in the past, as some are, are expressing it today in the present, or as others will in the future. Obviously, as a consequence of their many practices of evolution, we would say in general. But that explains why all the senses are drawn in like a tortoise. How to reach it, might we ask, Drawing the senses in forcefully and voluntarily would be too hard, if at all possible. Practices promoting the non-indulgence of senses have brought hardship and dullness in life to an extent that the younger generations have decided to turn their back on spiritual evolution. Really the key is enlightenment. The self-governed sage is supremely fulfilled, ready to assist the rest of humanity. According to his or her own dharma. Thank you. The tumultuous senses and organs hurry away by force the heart, even of the wise man who striveth after perfection. Let a man, restraining all these, remain in devotion at rest in me, his true self. For he who hath his senses and organs in control possesses spiritual knowledge. The tremendous power of the senses and organs hurry away by force the heart. Mr. Judge reminds us of the central importance of the heart. It is the key to it all. The brain is only the servant of the heart, he said. We use an expression to describe the strength of our desires. <clears throat> we want something with all our heart. We are devoted to obtaining it. 
we know that we have higher and lower desires reflecting the dual aspect of kamamanas, the desire mind, the fulcrum between our attraction to the pleasures of existence in a material form and our attractions to more intangible ideals. Our true desire may be subtle. Such is the force of personal desire that we may think that we are devoted to maintaining the health of the body, but in reality, we are devoted to the perfection of form or vanity. Is there a force we may be used to enable our hearts to overcome the snares of delusion? First, we must examine our heart's desires, those things to which we are devoted. <clears throat> As we know, the Gita is sometimes referred to as the book of devotion. Nearly every chapter takes up an aspect of devotion. There is devotion by means of faith, devotion by means of spiritual knowledge, and by means of spiritual discernment. There is devotion by means of the right performance of action, and devotion by means of renunciation of action. Are these the aspects of devotion to which we are committed? Or are we more devoted to money, power, fame, family? What is our intent or motive? What is in our heart when we seek to obtain that which we desire? Krishna admonishes us to remain in devotion at rest in me, the true self. When one is fixed immovably in contemplation, he will attain to devotion. Through contemplation, we may rest in the self that is behind all outward appearances, the unity that is the one self of all. Does this mean that by restraining our senses and organs for half an hour, while we sit and concentrate upon the self, we may then go about our business in our usual fashion? Obviously not. This contemplation and devotion to the self means we must use the power of spiritual discernment to rigorously examine our motives in acting, to see the obvious ones and those that are more subtle. Is there the intent to benefit all? or the intent to benefit solely oneself. Mr. Judge suggests that we perform our duties with the intent to contribute to the welfare of all. Duty is the royal talisman, he said. Attention to duty requires skill in the performance of action. We must be able to put our whole heart into it. Let us imagine our heart as a garden. Our intentions are the seeds that will come to fruition in actions that reveal the true patterns of our thinking. If the fruits are not what we would wish, we may by study learn our motives and work to change our habitual, often unexamined thoughts. We can use the power of acting for and as the Supreme Self to see that our actions are in line with our higher aspirations. Our separative thoughts may be the only sacrifice we lay before the altar of our heart, described by HPB as holy and ever untrodden ground, invisible intangible, unmentioned, save through the still, small voice of our spiritual consciousness. Thank you. He who attendeth to the inclination of the senses in them hath a concern, for this concern has created passion. From passion, anger. From anger is produced delusion. 
from delusional loss of the memory, from the loss of memory, loss of discrimination, and from loss of discrimination, loss of all. Well, this intense passage follows well upon the other one just read because it describes the person who having just some inclination for sensual pleasure, money, power, fame, nevertheless, perhaps tries the spiritual path. And as the voice of the silence says, set not one soiled foot upon that ladder's lower rung, or the ladder will give way and overthrow thee. And this is a warning to all of us, if we have any inclination toward any of these passional desires, to deal with them first before we set out on this very profound and sacred path. Because what can happen, as according to the Shankya doctrine, which chapter two of the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita deals with, is the uh, separation of Purusha from Prakriti and the higher and lower Manas. Now, Manas, we know, is one. However, the lower Manas, when incarnated in the physical body, they can become heir to the senses. And of, of course, um, this is the blind king being controlled by his evil-minded son, Dhritarashtra, in the Mahabharata. And so what can happen is that a person beginning to fall into the inclination of senses, being concerned about this, having an affair or drinking alcohol, um, desiring money and more money, fame and more fame, power over others, either politically or simply in a home or work situation. It becomes uh, very passional. And of course, when these desires are not fulfilled, which they never will be fully, anger re results. And then, of course, one begins to be deluded and lose it. One starts lying and even can become a pathological liar, not knowing one is lying because one is deluded oneself and then forgetting uh, how all of this has led to destruction in the past, losing discrimination, and then totally losing it. This person may wind up in a mental institution or a criminal or uh, somehow, um, worst of all, if one perhaps has developed some spiritual powers like this, a black magician, which could, can do great harm to others. So it is a great warning in the Gita. And we can look at a passage uh, from Mr. Judge in an amazing pamphlet called The Powers of the Mind. <laughs> where Judge says the mental characteristics belonging to lower manas are those which the higher manas, aided by the buddhi and atma, has to fight and conquer. Higher manas, if able to act, becomes what we sometimes call genius. If completely master, then one becomes a god. But memory continually presents pictures to lower manas. And the result is that the higher is obscured. Sometimes, however, along the pathway of life, we do see here and there men who are geniuses or great seers and prophets. In these, the higher powers of manas are active. In the person illumined, such were the sa great sages of the past. Men like Buddha, Jesus, Confucian, Zoroaster, and others. So we can all become very great if we do not yield to these inclinations. And we can be a very great help to humanity by following the instructions of Krishna in the Gita. But we have to remember also the admonition of the voice of the silence. Look not behind or thou art lost. 
Just like Lot's wife in the Bible, you don't look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. That is past. That is gone. Look forward to the light and do not ever attend to the temptations, inclinations of the senses. And this uh, will bring us eventual peace and harmony on the path. Thank you. But he who, free from attachment or repulsion or objects, experienced them through the senses and organs, with his heart obedient to his will, attains to tranquility of thought. <clears throat> this brings uh, to mind a quote that's uh, in uh, an article by HPB, uh, a short quote, and she says, uh, it's in the article Chelas and Lay Chelas, and she says, there is no impossibility to him who wills. <clears throat> and it's interesting how they indicate in the Gita that if the will is obedient to the heart, that one can attain tranquility of thought seems seemingly to indicate that uh, we can direct our will in different uh, directions. And if the will is put in the wrong direction, it will bring the opposite of tranquility of thought. It will bring a lot of strife and a lot of uh, suffering to, to the being. And uh, <clears throat> when we look at desire, and the various different effects that uh, desire has upon the will and vice versa. And all the various different uh, desires that color the mind. And uh, we see in Patanjali's that talks about the, of trying to attain a one-pointedness and to try to break free from the the coloring of the mind, the modifications that take place in the mind. And we can see how desire drives us towards all these various different things that make themselves present in the mind. And we, no sooner do we give them attention, they seem to take life and they seem to grow and then blossom into uh, all sorts of beautiful flowers or or weeds, things that are maybe not too uh, so pretty to look at. <clears throat> so, and while this all seems to be going on, there's this constant, the winds of karma, it seems, are just flowing, always flowing always presenting different choices to us. And in the voice uh, by H.P. Blavatsky, you, you see the idea where she presents that, you know, to live to benefit mankind is the first step. And that seems to indicate some sort of purity that must be attained, some sort of direction of the desire, some sort of... Uh, of uh, a different intent than maybe what we're used to, maybe what we've been conditioned to. Because most of this, these desires, it seems, they're just, you know, uh, they, uh, they just conditionally seem to flood us, almost like it's normal. <clears throat> but theosophy presents a different picture for us to look at. And then later in that book, in The Voice, she indicates that, uh, you know, the second uh, step is to practice the uh, paramitas, the uh, the virtues, and to and to try to understand and practice, and to assimilate, and to uh, apply those to our our actions, our thoughts, our motives, and then further in that book, uh, she indicates that 
you know, we try to uh, to try to attain a, a one pointedness, a uh, while while engaged in the practice of of, of motive and the practice of the virtues to try to align oneself with uh, with the master, uh, with the masters or with the higher self, however one like wants to look at it. And to <clears throat> to try to take aim at that, to try to 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 hit that target, to to open oneself up to that awareness, to that relationship, to that understanding. And uh, obviously, this takes uh, much practice, and and we all try this at various different levels, and. Uh, and an interesting thing that comes from the uh, the Crest Jewel of Wisdom or the Vivika Chudamani, <clears throat> where they talk about uh, trying to attain the 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 ability to to uh, to be able to distinguish between what is seen and the seer. Uh, they use the the symbology of to look at it like a you know a glass of water to a glass of milk. And we you know we can see when we look at a glass of water, you, there's clarity, there's purity there. And if we try to see through a glass of milk, it's it's not so easy to do. There's lots of uh, you know different uh, uh, life that's within the milk, lots of color, lots lots of shape, lots of a uh, different consistency. So <clears throat> once again, the crest jewel seems to indicate uh, to to try to build that skill, to try to, to distinguish that and to become well-versed in that. Uh, and then later on in, in, in the instructions within that book, it seems to indicate that uh, when one has attained that to some degree, once again, to, to point oneself towards the, the divine being, the, the self, the, the master or the masters, and to to try to hit that mark uh and then they bring up the imagination and it's interesting how the imagination is uh this this uh this thing that seems to always be able to present many a multitude of things from the past or from the present or from the future and to imitate uh, all sorts of colors and shapes and sounds. <clears throat> and they indicate that in the crest that to try to use that imagination, similar to what's said in the voice actually, where she says to, to use one's thoughts or they will use you. And to try to <clears throat> act as a, or later at other places in, 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 in the teachings where they talk about the masters, how they people their current. Uh, they create a a, uh, a people they're current with uh, 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 thoughts that are helpful to to mankind, almost like a sunshine to be able to shine like a sun, and to emanate that. And um, so back to the crest, and the crest uh, talks about you know trying to hit that mark of the of the divine self of the of the real self the eternal and another uh, little uh, suggestion that's put forth forth there is to try to assimilate that all that no separateness between the non-eternal and the eternal that all things are that self all things are the eternal even though there's an aspect of it that is temporary an aspect that is constantly moving and changing and throwing us off course and challenging us and tempting us at so many different levels and to try to purify all of that. And uh, so I believe that's what it, uh, when it's indicating that uh, to be able to make one's heart obedient to that will and uh, while in the body, uh, but not uh, another quote, I think it's of Judges, where he says, uh, you know, to be in the world, but not of it, you know, not to try to escape karma, not to try to, uh, to, you know, to, 
to manipulate karma, but to embrace it and and use it, as Mr. Crosby points in many places, you know, to see it as a as a as a cult uh, uh, opportunity, a daily opportunity to fine tune oneself, to know if one is patient. How is one going to know if one's patient if they're not tested, or calm, or or, or charitable and giving? Only when we're put to the pinch, put to the test. So, and then it seems like it's uh, at, the, at the like the end of that quote there. If one is able to to attain to that in any way, in any small degree, there will be some sort of tranquility of thought, uh, little by little, to the to the point of where we become masters ourselves, become uh, you know great adepts with, with vast wisdom and vast knowledge and 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 and, and vast compassion. So. That is all I have to share. Thank you. And this tranquil state attained therefrom shall soon result a separation from all troubles. And his mind being thus at ease, fixed upon one object, it embraceth wisdom from all sides. In the notes on the Bhagavad Gita, William Quan Judge starts with the sentence, a mighty spirit moves through the pages of the Bhagavad Gita. Right at the beginning, we see the mighty spirit of this little book. The second chapter is dense and filled with so much information. In fact, apart from the last chapter, the 18th chapter, this has more than 70 verses and is one of the longest. It is important to note that when Arjuna asked the question about the deportment and qualities of a self-governed sage, 15 verses are devoted to explaining, repeating, and elaborating about the sthita pragnya or the self-governed sage. Which brings me to think and ponder that this book written so long ago, just like Homer's Odyssey, is that both probably started as an oral tradition. So when we look at this verse, which is verse 65, it starts with the tranquil state that was already mentioned in the previous verse. In the Dhammapada, Canto 25, talking about the bhikkhu, Again, a self-governed sage. It says, the bhikkhu who is calm in body, calm in speech, calm in mind, who is firm, who has thrown out the baits of the world, is named the tranquil one. What a beautiful rendition of the same idea in the Dhammapada. Just like the bhikkhu, the mind is at ease, fixed on one object, as was mentioned in the earlier. And uh, William Kwan Judge in Patanjali calls this one-pointedness in Sanskrit, ekagrata. I shall end my presentation with a story related by Damodar Mavalankar about the phrase, fixed on one object. He was a student of theosophy who became a mystic and joined the Lodge of the Masters. He wrote this in five years of theosophy under the article called Contemplation. So here's the story. King Janaka was considered to be a Raja Rishi a royal sage. He had his detractors. 
Some of his detractors could not understand how he could govern his kingdom and still be a Rajarishi. So King Chanaka decided to perform a test with them. He made them carry pots filled to the brim with water on a busy street where there were beautiful, voluptuous dancing and singing girls. The detractors were told that their heads were on the line if they spilled even a drop of water. So they all went and accomplished the task with great precision. When King Janaka asked them, what did you see in the streets? Their answers were unanimous. We were so busy concentrating on our pots of water. How could we see anything? Tranquility, all connection with the lower mind and the senses has been erased and eased. And ekagrata leads to illumination of the buddhi, self-conscious godhood. Thank you. The man whose heart and mind are not at rest is without wisdom or the power of contemplation. Who doth not practice reflection hath no calm. And how can a man without calm obtain happiness? What this passage tells us is that there's a direct connection between inner calmness, reflection, contemplation, and the ability to experience clarity, wisdom, and happiness. True happiness will remain elusive if one's mind is in a constant state of unrest. A calm and reflective mind is essential for the attainment of wisdom. A restless heart and a restless mind signify that there is inner turmoil, anxiety, or a lack of peace existing within. If inner turmoil can be seen as an active rajasic state, full of heat and motion, reflection and contemplation are sattvic, cool, compassionate, and detached. Think of a lake perfectly reflecting its surroundings. If reflection and contemplation are necessary to make calm and insightful connections, and to produce an understanding of the components of our experiences, then without reflection and contemplation, wisdom cannot blossom. A restless state of mind hinders intellectual and reflective capacities, and those parts of the brain involved in thought and reflection, like the frontal cortex, actually switch off, shunting energy to the restless and rajasic limbic system. Compare the five capabilities of the limbic system. Freeze, flop, friend, fight, or flight. With the five capabilities of the frontal cortex. Reasoning and comprehension, problem solving, impulse control, creativity, and perseverance. The ability to make sound judgments and decisions results from deep thought and calm reflection. Contemplation and reflection also involve introspection, questioning, and thoughtful consideration of one's experiences. Without this practice, one will not be able to gather the fruits of experience. Reflection and contemplation leads us to clarity, wisdom, and happiness. Reflection is a deliberate and conscious effort to gain insight, to learn from past experiences, and make sense of our world. The foundation of reflection is self-awareness. It's about being conscious of your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. One component of reflection is critical thinking and it involves analyzing and evaluating information, experiences, and ideas, where you consider the significance and implications of the events in your life. 
Open-mindedness is also crucial to reflection. This means being willing to consider different perspectives, challenging your own assumptions, and being receptive to new ideas. Reflection often involves asking yourself questions. These questions can vary on the context, but they typically aim to encourage deeper thinking. Examples might include, what did I learn from this experience? How did I feel at the time and how do I feel now? What worked well? What could be improved? And what would I do differently in a similar situation? Reflection is not only about looking back, but also about looking forward. Setting goals based on your reflections can help guide your future actions. It's being proactive, not passive. Reflection and contemplation often require time and patience. It's not a rushed process. Taking the time to reflect allows for a more thorough examination of experiences and promotes a deeper understanding of oneself and one's surroundings. Reflection and contemplation become the most effective when they become a regular part of a routine. Integrating moments of reflection into daily life helps build a habit of mindful thinking and contributes to ongoing growth. Reflection and contemplation are a multifaceted process that involves self-awareness, critical thinking, open-mindedness, and a deliberate effort to learn from experience. They're valuable tools for fostering a deeper understanding of oneself in the world and will lead to clarity, wisdom, and happiness. Thank you. The uncontrolled heart, following the dictates of the moving passions, snatcheth away the spiritual knowledge as the storm, the bark upon the raging ocean. And therefore, O great armed one, he is possessed of spiritual knowledge, whose senses are withheld from the objects of sense. These beautiful passages have been recited by many throughout centuries and translated by notable people, such as the Gandhi, which was originally in Gujarati and then later translated into English by Mahadev Desai, and Swami Sarupanat uh, of the Dwaita Ashram, a follower of Vekananda, who is in the Himalayas at the Himalayan Institute. Uh, Gandhi's translation went, for when the mind runs after any of the roaming senses, it sweeps away understanding as a wind a vessel upon the waters. Therefore, O Mahabhav, he whose senses are reined on all sides from their objects is a man of secure understanding. And the Swami says, for the mind which follows in the wake of the wandering senses carries away his discrimination as a wind carries away a boat on the waters. Therefore, mighty arm, his knowledge is steady, whose senses are completely restrained from sense objects. So they are all telling about the same thing. And Arjuna, as we all know, seemed paralyzed at the start of the war. By the very thought of fighting his mentors, his elders, and his cousins, Krishna needed to bring him back into reality, the reality of the situation, as the commander of his forces, as he stood face to face with the armies of the very people who had forced him and his family 
into wrongful exile and now stood ready to vanquish them. It is clear from these passages that the writer of the Gita, Veda Vyasa, seems to be telling us all by the way of Krishna's advice to Arjun, that one should control one's emotions and act with prudence and discretion, unaffected and unbiased by the grasp of desires or emotional pulls of the moment. His advice is thus to always act in an objective manner in accordance with the needs of the situation. One should heed one's head and not one's heart in a moment of crisis. Most of us often are overcome by our passions and our emotions. And Krishna warns that these would lead to ruin. Be mindful at all times with discretion and thoughtfulness of the results of your action. Thank you. Shloka 69 Ya Nisha Sarva Bhutana Tashyam Jagarti Samyami Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani Sa Nisha Pashyato Mune What is night to those who are unenlightened is as day to his case. What seems as day is known to him as night, the night of ignorance. Such is the self governed sage. In order to become the self governed sage, one has to first know the self. The self cannot be known by the Vedas, nor by the understanding, nor by much learning. So he whom the self chooses by him alone can the self be gained. The self chooses him as his own, but the man who has not first turned aside from his wickedness, who is not calm and subdued, or whose mind is not at rest, he can never obtain self even by knowledge. So when one is calm, subdued, with mind at rest, and based on the wisdom about the true nature of oneself and the reality, there is discernment between the temporary and the permanent. Then there is complete surrender to the higher self, known as Ishwara Paridhana and Atma Nivedan. And then there is sincere desire to be guided, ruled, and assisted by the higher self. To suffer and to enjoy whatever the higher self has in store for one by way of discipline and experience. Then there is complete subjugation to the higher self to the effect where the pilgrim says, not my will, but thine will be done. Then and only then the mind is completely absorbed, always in the bliss of the self. Such a person is known as Theta Pragna. And this leads to inner equanimity. He is considered as one of perfectly poised discernment and remains asleep towards the sense objects while he is ever awake to the state of the Supreme towards which all others, other beings remain asleep. Thus he becomes a self-governed sage. Next please.
अपूर्णमान मचला प्रतिष्ठम समुद्र माप प्रविशंति यदवत तदवत कामायम प्रविशंति सर्वे सशांति मापनोति न काम काम द मैन हुज डिजायर्स एंटर इज हार्ट एज वॉटर्स रन इन टू द अनस्वेलिंग पैसे भोशन विच दो एवर फॉल येट डज नॉट क्विट its bed obtaineth happiness not he who lusteth in his lusts there is one more quality of knowing such a person like even though all the rivers get flooded and fall into the ocean yet the ocean never swells in volume nor transgresses its limits nor in the summer even when the river gets dry and yet the ocean never gets reduced in volume in the same manner the mind of the sita pragna does not get agitated by the advent of success and glory or desires and lust he takes no cognizance of either the coming or going of these but remains firm undisturbed in the bliss of the self he attaches no importance for the worldly glory or happiness nor even cares for nirvana or heavenly bliss he has killed his personality dropped all egoism renounced all desires and how does he achieve this wqj says such attitude of mind must be attained as will enable one to look into the realities of the things the mind must escape from the mere formalities and conventions of life even though outwardly one seem to obey all of them and should be firmly established on truth which truth the truth that man is the copy of the universe and has in himself a portion of the supreme being and to the extent this is realized will be the clearness of the perception of truth a realization of this leads inevitably to the conclusion that all other men and beings are united with us and this removes egotism which is the result of the notion of separateness once this attitude is achieved then he abides in the great bliss of the oneness in the universal life is completely united and is in harmony with all thank you The man who, having abandoned all desires, acts without covetousness, selfishness, or pride, deeming himself neither actor nor possessor, attains to rest. Today uh, has been very uh, helpful as a student to be able to participate in uh, this uh, this event, and so I give thanks to. to the 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 students that have uh, put it together and uh, participated in it and uh it it's very helpful to 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 uh to contemplate these ideas uh while uh practicing listening to others and also figuring out one what one is going to say when it's their turn so uh so thanks for that uh this quote here Uh, it makes uh, it makes me think of the of what is said in the in the voice in the very first couple pages of the voice where she indicates that uh, a couple different things she indicates first uh, how the, the 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 situation is going on in, in the mind and the position that uh, that the uh, practitioner the disciple the student must uh, must take. 
and and uh, in regards to the mind. And then, of course, she quotes, you know, the you know the whole idea of the mind being that thought producer, and 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 one must, uh, you know, and and slaying the real within us, and stealing away the the true reality in a sense. And and as uh, as students, uh, we are to uh, to try to you know to address that within ourselves, to you know to become the slayer of that. Uh, you know to to understand the mind and then she indicates uh something very interesting which uh you know where it talked you know it reminded me of of, of this quote and, and the one in the gita here of 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 you know how does one how, how does one become you know uh you know uh, uh, the actor uh you know uh, and, and while in and while in rest and, and be able to have tranquility, to be able to have a centeredness. And she seems to indicate there that uh, we, you know, to try to reach the the ability to 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 look at one's uh, form, to look at one's uh, self, their personal self, in the way that we do as we we see ourselves in dreams. To try to uh, you know uh, understand life uh, in, in in not so so much a concrete way, to be able to seize through some of the unrealities of the concrete uh, waking consciousness, the physical existence, and to see that there could be a a subtlety to it, a uh, a non concreteness to it. Uh, something that uh, our senses tell us otherwise. They they seem to indicate that things are solid and things are are separate. And uh, and then she then she addresses the the idea of 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 of, uh, of, of trying to discern the one, of of taking that inner sound uh, and having the inner sound kill out all the outer. All the sounds that are around us, the sounds that are in the room right now, the sounds that are floating through our minds, uh, the multifaceted, uh, you know, uh, uh, colors and, and sounds that, that take place within our minds and, and also externally to try to, to blend that into, into something of a, that, that is more real. And is indicating just that, she says, she goes, when to himself his form appears unreal, as do on waking all the forms he sees in dreams. When he has ceased to hear the many, he may discern the one, the inner sound which kills the outer. Then only, not till then, shall he forsake the region of a sat, the false, to come unto the realm of sat, the true. And it's uh, interesting how we have to try to uh, attain all these. Uh, of course, there's, I guess, sitting meditation, uh, which is, uh, I guess, maybe more popular than, say, uh, lifelong meditation or constant meditation. And so, but in reference to like the lifelong meditation, you know, to while acting, while kind of uh, being observant and discriminating of the sensory uh, nature that's taking place, like even right now within us, and to try to reach some sort of reality, uh, a true sense of that, to see through the falseness of that, uh, which kind of goes back to uh, what was I spoke of before with the will, because obviously that takes a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of will, it takes a lot of determination and focus, and and trial and temp and, and and attempts to do so, and many failures, of course, and uh, and as indicated in Theosophy, nothing like that is going to is going to come to one quickly or easily. Uh, it's going to be, you know, it's going to, it, and it has been beyond our present personalities. Uh, theosophy indicates that's why we're in the position we are now. 
and and then in the future also that you know it's it's uh it's not a one life type of of uh manifestation or or attempt it's uh it's no small feat i think blavatsky says it uh in places where she says you know the the man that attempts uh, to attain to that is is much greater than the man that will 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 climb the himalayas even though how hard that would be on a physical level to attain uh, that uh, feat of uh, climbing a great mountain, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, uh, much more so apparently in, you know, to, for one to try to step upon the path of, of the masters and to, and to try to attain uh, in some degree what the, what has seemed to be indicated within our teachings of of what what is possible uh within humanity so <clears throat> i uh <clears throat> i think i just want to quickly go over my i had a I, sorry i have to didn't have my oh yeah so um one second here oh I, no i guess uh I guess that's all I have to share on that. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, that's it. This, O son of Pritha, is dependence upon the Supreme Spirit. And he who possesses it goes no more astray. Having obtained it, if therein established at the hour of death, he passes on to Nirvana in the Supreme. So these closing words of the only the second chapter of the Gita show how the work will unfold like flower uh, from within without. Uh, I'm really honored to be asked to do a summary of even half of one chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, especially after hearing such wonderful commentaries by fellow students who have explained so much and given us so much to consider and think about. We might try to put the Bhagavad Gita in a little bit of context. Uh, it's been called the Song Celestial. Uh, in modern theosophical terms, we might call it the Theosophia of ancient India, what the Hindus themselves called Sanatana Dharma, the eternal Dharma. The eternal religion. Now, as was indicated, the, the Gita is only a small portion of the Mahabharata. I believe it's about 700 verses, and the Mahabharata contains, uh, as a, the largest epic poem in the world, about 100,000 verses. The Gita represents the keynote to the spiritual impulse needed as Humanity entered the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, the Age of Ignorance, but also the Age of Opportunity. And in that Dark Age, humanity has never been left without friends. The Gita is but one of many sacred texts meant to inspire, guide, and enlighten humanity over centuries, now over millennia. Works such as this and others that were mentioned, the Dhammapada, the Del Te Ching, the works of Shankara, Plato, Pythagoras, the lives of Buddha and Jesus, oh, countless others, all were brought into focus by the modern theosophical movement inaugurated over 100 years ago by H.P. Blavatsky and William Q. Judge. It's why we celebrate Great Teacher's Day on it's the date of the founding of that movement with the formation of the Theosophical Society in 1875. All these figures stand out as beacons of light in a dark world, and they always point to the essential spiritual nature of man and the existence of a path of perfection accessible to anyone willing to make the effort. HPB wrote, follow not me or my path, follow the path that I show the masters who are behind. 
And she was only but echoing the words of Jesus, the gentle sage of Galilee, 2,000 years ago, who reportedly said, greater works than these ye shall do. So the path shows us, that path shows us, we are pot all potentially self-governed sages. In one of the translations of the Gita by Charles Johnston, the phrase self-governed sage is rendered silent seer. And I think it's a wonderful compliment to that phrase, self-governed sage. These teachers, great as they are, they all point out they are not unique phenomena. They are not creations of a personal God, nor are they freaks of nature, accidents of chance, something to be repeated, if at all, only by flukes of biology. No, they represent the heart of the universe, the heart of potentiality for all life. What is the path that they indicate? Now, how did these sages, we could ask ourselves, how could they become self-governed? And therefore, how can we also become self-governed? We could ask, like Plato did, what would a self-governed community look like? A self-governed country? A self-governed world? In a republic, Plato proposes that to have a good state, we have to start with good individuals. That is, at least a few self-governed individuals. Where do we start? Well, we only can start where we are, with an internal recognition that, at least in principle, there are universal values we can grasp. These are not things outside of our realm. They're not things that we can't understand. They're things we can begin to glimpse and then try to follow up as, with as practical an application as possible, even if those principles are only suspected. We can start to act as if these ideals and ideas are real. So, several students have put the first, well, second chapter, really, first two chapters of the Gita in perspective, where the pupil Arjuna is a kind of every man. He's us. He's looked over the looks over the battlefield of his life, and he doesn't like what he sees. It's not a superficial despondency. He is done. He sits down in the chariot and basically tells Krishna, what do I do? Krishna tells him, do your duty. Right in front of you, you know how to do it. And he very briefly appeals to his ego. He says, what would it look like if you didn't do your duty? You know, all those warriors would just laugh at you. Well, he doesn't go very far with that idea, but he says it enough to get Arjuna's attention. And then he basically tells him, look, we're all immortal. I, Krishna, can remember my past lives. But you, Arjuna, you've forgotten yours. You need to begin to rule yourself from within based on what is real not from what is without, which is always transitory. Now, this early in the Gita, 16 chapters yet to go, Krishna obviously can't tell Arjuna everything. So that's what he does tell him, what he can, that there is something real in you and in us. So, so go ahead, do what you need to do. Don't become attached to the results. Now, the balance between those two, the real and the non-attachment, he calls equal-mindedness or yoga. So a balanced mind leads to right knowledge and right knowledge to right action. He calls it karma yoga, concentration while engaged in action. So what prevents full devotion? What prevents that focus? Very simple. Desire. The things we want, the things we don't like, what we're attached to, every, everything that, that we, we think we want, 
everything we used to want, things we used will want in the future. But Krishna says that the highest ideal is only attained by a few, but everyone can attempt it, regardless of where we think we are or who we think we ought to be. There's something timeless about our motives. So if we're suddenly confronted by what we are, we're not, by, not just by what we've done in the past. So with right motive, we can become better performers of action. How? Krishna has one word for it, devotion. It clears the mind and soul of the clouds of sense. I love the analogy given earlier about the sky. It's the same kind of idea. The clouds crowd our vision. Devotion to the highest that we can, that we can find in ourselves and in the world. Plus, learning about what's real and what's not real will lead us on the path toward wisdom. So we need devotion, faith in that highest, and right action. Neither sufficient in itself, but both are needed to make a whole. Now, why does that work? Because by doing so, we enter that path outlined by all the great teachers. You know, Krishna is something of a reform. He's actually more than something. He is a reformer. He's an iconoclast. And he says that, you know, all the worship of the Vedas, all the things that we do out, outward sacrifices for, rituals and so forth, they all give results. Those results are temporary. And the wheel, wheel of life still goes on because there's un, unspent, delayed karma from our past and present actions that will wait for us. So attachment to those actions, attachment to those senses assures rebirth over and over again. That's why at the very end of this second chapter, Krishna says, if you establish this at the hour of death, that is, make it be the, the, the sounding note, the keynote of your life. And you pass on to nirvana in the, in the supreme. Another translation puts it, instead of nirvana in the supreme, calls it union with the eternal. It's what H.P. Blavatsky talks about in The Voice of the Silence. In order to become the knower of all self, Thou hast the first of self to be the knower. That's the really the message of the rest of the Gita, only hinted out in a way in seed form, in, in outline form in this chapter. But it's waiting, like the message of all the great teachers, for us to listen and to apply for ourselves. It's that old small path to self-knowledge, which all of us can follow if we make the effort. That is the path of the self-governed sage, the silent seer. Thank you. HPB, one true adeptship. It is but the occultist, the Eastern adept, who stands a free man, omnipotent to his own divine spirit as much as man can be on earth. He has rid himself of all human conceptions and religious side issues. He is at one and the same time a Chaldean sage, a Persian magi, a Greek theurgist, an Egyptian hermetist, a Buddhist rahat, and an Indian yogi. 
he has collected into one bundle all the separate fractions of truth widely scattered over the nation and holds in his hand the one truth, a torch of light which no adverse wind can bend, blow out, or even cause to waver. Not he, the Prometheus, who robs but a portion of the sacred fire, and therefore finds himself chained to Mount Caucasus for his intestines to be devoured by vultures, for he has secured God within himself and depends no more on the whim and caprice of either good or evil deities. The Great and Peaceful Ones from Adi Shankara's Viveka Chudamani. Shanta Mahanto Nivasanti Santo Vasanta Valloka Hitam Charantaha Tirnaha Swayam Bhima Bhavarnavam Janan Ahe Tunanyana Pitarayantaha Great and peaceful ones. The great and peaceful ones live regenerating the world. Having crossed the ocean of embodied existence, they freely aid all other who seek to cross it. The very essence and inherent will of Mahatmas is to remove the suffering of others. Just as the ambrosia red moon pulls the earth heated by the intense rays of the sun, Los grandes y pacíficos viven regenerando el mundo como la llegada de la primavera. Habiendo cruzado el océano de la existencia encarnada ellos mismos, ayudan libremente a todos los demás que buscan cruzarlo. La esencia misma y la voluntad inherente de Mahatmas es eliminar el sufrimiento de los demás. Así como la luna de Ambrosia de sí misma enfría la tierra calentada por los intensos rayos del sol. Les grands êtres de paix. Les grands êtres de paix vivent, régénérant ainsi le monde comme la venue du printemps. Ayant eux-mêmes traversé l'océan de l'existence incarnée, ils aident librement tous ceux qui cherchent à le traverser. L'essence même et la volonté inhérente des Mahatmas est d'éliminer la souffrance des autres êtres, tout comme la lune rafraîchit d'elle-même, grâce à ses rayons d'ambroisie, la terre chauffée 
par les intenses rayons du soleil. Det stora och det fridfulla. Det stora och det fridfulla regenererar världen, liksom ankomsten av våren. Efter att ha korsat oceanen av förkroppsligad existens, hjälper det frivilligt andra att korsa den. Essensen och den inneboende viljan av Mahatmas är att frigöra andra från lidande. Precis som denna brosiga strålande månen själv svalkar jorden upphettad av solens intensiva strålar. Mahan or Santipurna Log Mahan or Santipurna Log Basant ke Agavan ki tara Dunya ko Purna Jeevit karte huye jite hai Swang Dehdari Mahan Sagar ko Par karne ke baad Vye un sabhi logon ki Satantra roop se Sahayata karne ke Jho Ichcha par karne chate hai Mahatmao ko Saar or अंत निर्हित इच्छा दूसरों के दुख को दूर करने करता है जैसे स्वयं अमृत किरण वाला चंद्रमा सूर्य की तीव्र किरणों से गर्म हुए पृथ्वी को ठंडा करते हैं So we've come now to the end of our program. I'm sorry that we've run over a bit, but I suppose I feel like many of you do, uh, incredibly grateful for the opportunity to hear the teachings. Um, we're incredibly rich, every one of us. We've, we've inherited the sacred texts uh, of great teachers, which uh, keep alive and in the world the very ideas that humanity needs to move forward. I'm incredibly grateful to all the people in the presentation today who gave their very, very best and uh, filled the last hour and a half or three quarters with their insight and um, ideas. Uh, I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted at the brilliance and insightfulness of, of all the contributions today. It was really an incredible experience. I really think that all human growth begins with inspiration. We, we, we want to live, each one of us, a life of ins being inspired, of inspiration. Uh, in inspiration itself is kind of like spirit being inserted into matter, infused into matter. I'm, thinking it like the light that comes into leaves of, of, a, of a plant that starts photosynthesis. So, you know, there was so much shared today. There's no way to remember it all. It will be recorded and you'll be able to um, jump to the sections that you want to hear again or watch the whole thing again. I'll certainly put it online. But I think in the end, each one of us is, is um, trying to use our intuition to find that jewel that one idea that that's the next idea that we need. And we have all these seeds that have been shared today. And certainly we can see just how incredibly rich just a single shloka of the Gita is. It might be sufficient for an entire lifetime to take just one sentence and put it to good use for an, for an, uh, an entire lifetime. Um, the, the functions of great teachers in human evolution is absolutely vital and essential. They're the masters of devotion. Devotion to the cause of human enlightenment and human solidarity. The, their role is to, to reveal the teachings, but it is not done just by words. It's done through example, exemplification. The, the, the great teachers embody the teachings. The, the, the teacher has become the path, him or herself. 
And that, that's indicated in the voice of the silence. Um, the goal of the disciple is to reveal the path to others by becoming the path themselves in whatever small way that they can. And I think the speakers today and the contributors today gave evidence to that. And it's important to remember also that the, the great teachers are not relics of the past. They're very much alive right this very moment and at all times in the here and now. Krishna, Buddha, Plato, Lao Tzu, just to name a few, are uh, much more than statues or stories. They're ever-present forces for good in the world. And I think their influence is ever available to us when our motive is high and our focus is sufficient. And each one of us, as was mentioned by Wes, is a, is a great teacher in potentia. We, we are seeking to become servants of the human race, like they are. And that's the great joy in life, is to make a difference in another human being's life. All of us who are parents and grandparents, teachers and uncles and aunts, we know that. The great joy in life is to make another life better. So we try to shed a little light on the path, whatever light we have. Uh, and we do it for our sisters and brothers. Um, so... I want to thank everybody for their participation today and the, for their attendance. Uh, we look forward to get, coming together again in the future and other events and activities that we do. But I want to thank all of you for your time and your consideration. And again, to thank all the participants. And uh, we'll close the meeting now. I'll keep it open for a minute if anyone would like to uh, put their hands up and make say something to the group. But um, again, thank you very much for uh, attending today's uh, Great Teachers event. Okay. Let's uh, go about our days and evenings. Uh, Judy, you want to say one last word? Uh, yes, I just want to say that all the brothers and sisters have truly shown why the Gita is the study of the depths. Mm -hmm. There is just no end to the depth that we can find in this great work. So thank you, especially those who read in Sanskrit and other languages. It's just marvelous. Mm -hmm. Ivania? I just want to say thank you to every single one of you. I really enjoy all the presentations. And I'm in the second time reading the Bhagavad Gita. And it obviously, you know, it's so much depth and, and so much to learn. And I can feel every single one of you energy. And wow, it's amazing. It's just an honor. Thank you so much. Right. I was just thinking that someone mentioned the image of an unswelling ocean, and you think of the uh, that element and can be sort of held by it, and yet at the same time, the talks in here had great, great swells of, of them, of uh, will and effort and uh, energy of... Uh, of of great uh, of diversity in them. And at the same time, they had a deep calm and relaxation in it that, that uh, I just was greatly appreciative of. Thank you all. Thank you, Ray. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Have a, uh, have a wonderful uh, uh, winter and fall, and we'll come see you again in the spring. All the best. Okay.